Yeah, uh, my name is, uh, you can call me Jess. Um, and when I took the precepts here, uh, my precept name is Myoju, so you can also call me uh, Jess Myoju. You can, um, next slide, please. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about um, anthropology, um, certainly cultural anthropology, which is my area. And then I'm going to talk you through just a few of my particular research projects and at the end talk about the one that I'm working on now, which is a book about Daifukuji. Mm -hmm. So um, when, we, when we say anthropology, um, we actually mean the study of all human beings in all times and all places, which is pretty bonkers, but that is, what we per, that is what we purport to study in anthropology. And we do that through having um, four different fields that kind of grab onto different parts of the elephant of humanity. Um, so uh, we have cultural anthropology, which is what I do, and that is really focused on living cultures. So what does um, a particular culture or society or subculture, what do they believe, what do they practice, um, what meanings do different kind of um, rituals and uh, uh, practices and behaviors have for them? Uh, physical and biological anthropology kind of looks at um, evolution, it looks at, uh, they also look at, um, they do forensic anthropology, they do osteology, which is kind of looking at, you know, a, a tooth from 2,000 years ago and kind of getting a sense of what that person in that culture uh, ate um, and what their, their nutrition was like 2,000 years ago. Um, archaeology, of course, is really interested in the material culture that's recovered from the past. So an archaeologist would do a dig of a community um, <clears throat> from 100 years ago or, or 500 years ago or 5,000 years ago, and by looking at their material culture that they dig up, have a, um, be able to kind of make some, um, some useful conclusions and hypotheses about how that community lived. Uh, linguistic anthropology looks at language, right? So what are, what are the words that we use? What, um, the way that we speak, how does that affect the way that we see the world? Um, and linguistic anthropologists do work historically um, and also kind of in contemporary times. So a linguistic anthropologist might uh, be really, really focused on um, the way a particular uh, uh, dialect has, is changing um, in a particular space. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Um, I'm going to focus on culture anthropology because that's what I do. Um, I actually would consider myself uh, an anthropologist of religious communities, um, so that's been my focus. Uh, but anthropologists um, study everything. So there are cultural anthropologists that are studying financial markets. There are cultural anthropologists that are studying subcultures at the World Bank. There are anthropologists that are studying um, economics, uh, anthropologists that are studying governance and politics at different levels. Um, for me, my focus has always been on, in um, mostly religious cultures, uh, but also um, some kind of creative cultures uh, like uh, dance and music. Um, and uh, I've also always had a, a fascination with um, with globalization, with the ways that, that things change and move across boundaries and cultures, and uh, so that um, has been my, my main interest. Um, one of the things that people think is that anthropologists, you know, don't have opinions about things, right? They think, oh, well, anthropologists are just supposed to like capture things exactly as they are. Uh, we've kind of given up as cultural anthropologists in, in uh, considering ourselves kind of hard scientists. We don't think that anymore. We're, you know, we're collecting stories and then we're representing those stories to other people. We're doing our very best to represent the stories and communities of other, others in the most respectful way that we can. So we don't th really think of that as a science. We could think of it as like one foot in the social sciences and one foot in the humanities. Um, and certainly, we often do um, become involved in the, in the communities that we study. Um, again, that maybe was 
taboo a hundred years ago at the beginning of anthropology, but now there's a sense that, you know, we're people and we're working with other people that we like um, and that we're having relationships with and it's okay that we, um, that we become involved with the communities that we're studying. The only thing is that we have to be really honest about that to our readers, right? So when we're writing an ethnography, we have to be very clear. So I always have to say, you know, I'm coming at this project as a Buddhist myself. Um, you know, this is my relationship to the sangha that I'm writing about. That's, it's important to be uh, transparent with our readers about our positionality as, as um, researchers that are working within a community. Okay, next slide. Um, I'm just gonna read this quote because I think it's really useful in, in terms of kind of understanding why cultural anthropology is so important. I want to stress that the discipline does not showcase diverse human life ways to further exoticize those who live differently from us. In contrast, anthropology showcases cultural variation to illustrate the possibilities and potentials for human life and to demonstrate that the way of doing things we know best is neither normal nor necessarily right. It's just one way among a multitude of others. Everybody does it, but we all do it different. This is culture. And so I, I feel like anthropology is really a gift, um, certainly to, to, my, to myself as somebody who loves to learn about the way that other people think about things, but also to my students. So I, I work in Kansas, um, so I have most of my students are uh, you know, either Kansas farm kids, uh, some of them are coming from the city, but many of them have when they get to college, have never left Kansas, or at least they've never like met, left the Midwest. Right? They they don't. Uh, they've never met anyone who is not a Christian. Uh, many of them have, have never met anyone whose uh, religious beliefs or um, or cultural beliefs are different than their own. So I find it to be a, a really ex exceptionally important job, especially in a place like Kansas, where students in anthropology classes get exposed to the, the multiplicity of ways to be human and the, the many, many different ways that we can be human in, in valid and, uh, and good ways in the world. Okay, next slide. So um, the thing that makes cultural anthropology so special, I think, is uh, our methodology. Um, so we do field work, and field work means that we spend as much time as we can in a particular place. Uh, we do what we call participant observation. So it's not like we're like scientists putting things under a microscope. Um, instead, we just, we're, we're there and we absorb everything that we can. We talk to as many people as we can. Um, obviously, we need to get permission to be there. <laughs> um, and we, um, we're participants, right? And so um, th this can be very easy and delightful when you're working with a community that you enjoy. Um, this can be very, very, very hard and, uh, tr and troubling when you're working with a community where you might have uh, personal disagreements with, with kind of what people are doing. So, um, for example, if I were working with, um, I don't know, uh, uh, let's, I'm, a, 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 I'm a Democrat, and if I were working with like the QAnon community right now, if I was like, I'm going to do an ethnography of QAnon, which is a pretty far right group, that would be very difficult, right? But I, I could do it if I were, if I got permission, and if I said I want to, I'm, I want to do interviews. I'm going to, I'm going to um, fully immerse myself in your culture. Do interviews and do and do my best to kind of understand where you're coming from. I may not agree with you <laughs> at the end of all of that, uh, but that's okay. I don't have to be in full agreement with you. I'm going to try to represent your subculture uh, as honestly as I can. Right. Um, so yeah, sometimes uh, participant observation is is really easy. Like when you love the community you're working with. Like, uh, like I do here now, <laughs> and sometimes it's really hard. Um, let's see, so field work, uh, participant observation, 
lots of interviews. Um, once we get those interviews, we have to um, transcribe them. We have to do analysis in terms of kind of like what are the themes that come up over and over again. Uh, there's a whole coding process that um, I don't need to get into the, the nitty gritty of it, but you know we do try to make sure that we are, you know, even though as as storytellers as writers we are making decisions, we also try to make sure that the that what we what we find kind of the data that we've collected is guiding the process, so uh, so that it's not. Um, uh, divorced from the data that we've collected, right? So what are the things that came up over and over again? What are the what are the things that people said? What are the things that people care about? Right? Not what do I care about as a writer, but what does this community care about and why? Um, okay, the next slide. Okay. Sorry, I should have changed that to say just those anthropological <laughs> research projects. I I have used this slide for my students before, so apologies. Um, so basically, this just gives you a sense of some of the things that I've worked on. Uh, these are I've, I've published something in each of these areas. So uh, I, w I was trained as a South Asianist, so I did most of my research uh, for most of the beginning of my career in India. Um, so some of the things that I studied, um, I was looking at Buddhist pilgrimage. Um, so I spent a lot of time in the Buddhist pilgrimage places in India, so Bodh Gaya, Kushinagar, Dharamsala. Um, a little bit of time in uh, Sarnath, uh, you know, so places where people were making pilgrimage, either because they were important to the Tibetan community or because they were important to kind of Buddhism and the Buddha story. Um, I did a lot of work on transnational Tibetan Buddhism, so uh, I, I did a lot of interviews and data collection with the Tibetan refugee community in India, um, but I also did a lot of work with, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, uh, non-heritage Buddhists that kind of embraced Tibetan Buddhism, right, and what those communities looked like and what they did. I looked at um, holy objects in Buddhism. I was really interested in kind of statues, and um, uh, especially within the Tibetan tradition. I spent a lot of time looking at that. And then just looking at the Tibetan diaspora in general. Um, so, um, you know, where that, where that community was uh, coalescing, kind of um, the, some of the struggles that they faced in terms of being an exile community and for example, in India, uh, you know, they were in India for, they had been in India for 70, 80 years and still weren't able to get citizenship, right? They, they were kind of citizenless community, right? So how did they function? How did they, how were they able to travel without uh, countries' passports? Um, you know, what did they think Tibetan identity meant when their children and their children's children were being born outside of Tibet? So I, I have spent a little bit of time in Tibet. I spent one summer there, but I didn't do research there. I just did language acquisition work. Um, so in the in the United States, um, I've been really interested in Asian American communities. Um, so you know that's one of the things that I think is important, right? Um, Asia. Asia as a culture is very global, right? There there are a lot of you know. There is Asian culture, but there's also Asian American culture. There, are, the, the flow of ideas and beliefs and practices has been crossing borders for hundreds of years, right? And so I think that's an important. So I was really interested, uh, I did a bunch of research on Hindu and Sikh American religious identity. Um, th that was uh, work in the Washington DC area, so going to Hindu temples, going to Sikh gurdwaras. Um, I was looking, and I'll talk again, this is another one I'll talk a little more about, but the, uh, there's a, a folk dance called Garba Ras, and I thought it was super fun, and I really enjoyed it, and it became uh, th this really interesting window into kind of how how different cultures might shift once they, you know, move from India um, or Asia and then kind of come to the United States, right? So, 
I'll talk a little I'll talk a little bit more about that, but I also will address the religion in virtual worlds. That was another fun project, right? This idea that some people are choosing to practice their religion in virtual worlds, right, in digital spaces. I've also looked at academic culture, and of course, um, now I'm looking at Difficulty as a subculture. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I'm, I just picked three out of all of those to kind of talk about three completed projects to talk a little bit more about. Um, so this was one that I, uh, I did for years. Um, so uh, Garba Ras, or this particular form of, of Gujarati folk dance, um, is usually done around kind of the, the holy festival, um, and it has, uh, it came out of the Gujarati area in India, which is a particular state. So it has this real kind of regional um, ethnic uh, meaning. And um, it's done for a holiday, and when you see it done in India, thousands of people will come out and they'll dance around a, an altar of Amba Mana, who's one of the goddesses, and just thousands of people will dance these circle dances. Um, and it's quite extraordinary to do, and it's quite extraordinary to see. When I started looking at this in the United States, um, different collegiate groups had kind of taken this, this traditional dance and started choreographing dances um, and competing with each other as different university teams, right? So, so suddenly, instead of you know thousands of people dancing around an altar, it was you know a, a team of students that were kind of choreographing, and they had these themes that were you know like Batman theme or like <laughs> or, I mean, it was you know one of the teams calls themselves Basmati Ras, you know like they're 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 they're. they're they're, they're being playful and creative with the traditional dance form in a way that as an anthropologist, I, you know, I thought it was super fascinating. So, you know, trying to understand as an anthropologist, what are the changes that happened in the dance form? You know, why did they happen? Why, why do these uh, students love this dance form? Um, and what are some of the ways that um, it's still changing and what are maybe some of the things that uh, you know there's some disagreement about right so judging became a really big thing like how do you judge what is a more traditional costume in a context of this right and then but it becomes really important right it's like figure skating uh, you know you have different teams that like are like really angry at the end of the competition because they were like what do you mean our, our costumes were less traditional right so there has to be this this um, this whole new literature has to be made of kind of like how you're going to judge these things, right? And so one of the things we talk about in anthropology is the fact that tradition is always changing, right? Tradition is not this kind of static, stagnant thing. Tradition is always changing, and tradition is always being invented. So. There, this is a great example, right, is, is that you have a, a group of people that are making up rules about what's a traditional costume for a group for Garba Ross, right, and, and this is a, you know, completely different, and folks that were coming from India were like, what is this dance form? It's, I've never seen anything like this. So, um, just a really fun project, um, and you know, I enjoy dancing a lot, which is one of the reasons that I get so excited about bond dancing here. It's like super fun. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, so uh, my, my doctoral project, uh, so I got my PhD from Cornell in 2010. Um, I, this was the project that I worked on. And it was, a, and I'll just preface this with saying this was a really hard project for me. Um, not just because dissertations are always hard, but just because it was um, uh, a project where there was a lot of people that were very deeply invested in one side or the other, and they were very angry about, um, you know, very angry at the other side. <laughs> so I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more. Essentially, a, a, a Tibetan uh, Buddhist community that, that is headed by two Tibetan teachers, um, or was founded by two Tibetan teachers, 
but is mostly peopled by non-heritage converts. So they have 150 centers around the world. It's mostly a place where people who are converting to Tibetan Buddhism um, learn about the tradition. And they were um, really interested in, in building the biggest Buddha statue in the world. And they wanted to build it um, in Kushinagar, India, which is where the historical Buddha passed away. So um, these are some, uh, some kind of mock-ups of what this would look like. You could go to the next slide. Uh, let's see. So Kushinagar is in Uttar Pradesh. Sorry, kind of right around there. Next slide. Yeah. Um, so this gives you a sense of how big this statue would have been. Um, so you can see the Taj Mahal there. <laughs> you can see. You can see uh, the statue. So you can see it, it towers over the Statue of Liberty, yeah. right? So this is what the proposed statue would be, right? So it towers over the Taj Mahal, it would tower over the Statue of Liberty. Um, and, uh, you know, 500 feet, um, and they wanted to, to um, take something like 750 acres of land uh, from the local community in Kushinagar. And the, um, the government agreed to this, um, but the local community whose land was going to be taken did not agree to this. <laughs> so, so I had thought that I was going to be telling the story of like this like really interesting giant statue, right? And instead, um, I was telling the story of a very contentious, hotly debated, kind of painful subject, right? So the people that, that were advocating for the statue said, you know, in this world of like Disneyland and skyscrapers, like why shouldn't we have like a beautiful monolithic statue that that is, you know, glorious and can really um, help us focus on on our our Buddhist uh, commitments, right? And and our desires to be uh, born in the time of the Maitreya Buddha, right? Why shouldn't we have that? Um, and the local community was like. You can have that. Just don't take our land in order to, <laughs> to get that right. So there, and, you know, and I'm summing up uh, what was like a very hard story. But um, you can go to the next slide. Um, so this is the the group, the Foundation for the Preservation of the Mahayana Tradition, um, and, and as I said, you know, they were kind of guided by Tibetan uh, monks and. Um, Lamas, but most of the people who are donating were uh, non-heritage practitioners. You can go to the next slide. So um, this uh, was really a book in which I tried to do my due diligence by telling the story from both perspectives, right? So the first half of the book is kind of why, why build the biggest statue in the world, right? Why did this community want that? What was important about it to them? Um, I, you know, I told the story of, of you know, who is Maitreya, right? Maitreya is the future Buddha. Why is the future Buddha important in Tibetan Buddhism? Uh, why would people want to, to donate to a, a statue like this? And, um, and, and all of the work that was being done to try to make it manifest, right? So that was the, you know, um, including, for example, um, a relic tour that was touring around the world. Um, so they had some relics and they were fundraising for the statue projects uh, through um, a relic tour, which was honestly like very lovely. I was able to go to it several times. It was a very lovely event. Um, but it was complicated for me because they were doing fundraising for the statue, which I have had no problem with, except that I had just done you know several months of research with a local Indian community that was fighting against it, right? And so for me, it was really this like, uh, like a really horrible struggle um, to try to tell both sides of the story um, as carefully and respectfully as I could. The local community just uh, wanted nothing to do with this project, right? Um, they, and they were fine with it in theory, right? If it could have been done at, you know, somewhere else <laughs> and not at their expense, right? So in fact, uh, some of the advocates, and, and when I say the local community, there was a, um, a group called the Save the Land, um, 
the Save the Lamb, uh, I'm forgetting exactly, Save the Lamb Foundation. I forget how I translated it in the book, but um, they, uh, they blocked the national highway, they, they led um, hunger strikes, they were doing these rotating hunger strikes, and you have to understand, like, these are small farmers, right? These are people that have, like, portions of an acre in one of the smallest, um, poorest uh, states in India, which is already, um, you know, where farmers are already struggling. So for them to kind of be doing hunger strikes and, and protests and taking their time to kind of fight against this project because you know, the idea of losing their land uh, forcibly, right? Because this was going to be a forcible land acquisition, right? They were using um, the law to kind of say, well, we are going to, um, you know, it's kind of like if, if somebody wants to build a road for a highway and they, they take, a, they will take uh, a, a neighbor, they might take a neighborhood to do that. But in the United States, we do have some more protections and in, in, I'm not going to say it's always well done, but there's more protections in terms of at least making sure that there's fair compensation. So one of the things that the farmers was arguing was that the compensation was like laughably low, right? And that they would be ruined. So we're talking about thousands of families who said our lives will be absolutely ruined if this happens. Like we can't, we won't be able to, to buy land elsewhere, we're going to lose our community because even if we can buy land elsewhere, it'll be a much smaller plot and it'll be far away and we're going to lose all of our community connections that we've had for hundreds of years. And um, So, uh, you know, uh, I think I've talked enough about it, but the point is the, the, the Tibetan Buddhist community did not intend this to happen, right? The Tibetan Buddhist community was not hoping to harm people, right? What they were hoping to build a beautiful statue, right? The problem was that they weren't talking to the people on the ground. And so as an anthropologist, that's like a kind of a shocking lack of due diligence. <laughs> so it's, it, it doesn't, it, it certainly never made sense to me that, um, you know, if you want to do a really difficult project like this and you want to take land from local people and thousands of farming families, then your organization should be on the ground working with that, those, those people to make sure that they're okay, right? You're a Buddhist organization. Like you believe, you don't wanna cause suffering. <laughs> like you wanna, you wanna build a statue of loving kindness. You should do it with a modicum of loving kindness. So, so that's how, um, you know, that's why I do tend to say that I did, you know, after doing this research, I had a position. Like I couldn't say that I was, neutral. Um, I certainly had a position and I had to be clear about that with my writers, with my writers, with my readers right from the get-go. I have a position, right? I did this research, I talked to a lot of people, I spent years in the field and I have a position and here I'm going to try to tell the story as best I can from both sides but I'm not neutral about this. <laughs> and I, I spent a lot of time in Kushinagar, you know, with um, with the activists uh, that were fighting against the project. And, you know, if they asked me to speak at their protests, I would speak at their protests because I truly felt that they were being um, treated terribly. Um, so uh, just so that you know, the, the, the good news is that there was, um, uh, whether it was the financial crisis or whether it was um, pressure from, from other people within the community, this statue never got built. So, you know, I call it the, the, a cultural biography of the greatest statue never built. Um, now that said, they have, there have been whispers and talks about maybe trying to make this happen. If it happens, I hope that it happens in a more kind of careful way that is more collaborative with the community. And that, that's, um, that's always been my position. Like there's nothing wrong with the statue. It just has to be done in a, in a way that is um, of non-destructive, right? Uh, that kind of represents the very things that they're that they're trying to um, 
promote with, with the statue in the first place, right? The, the, the loving kindness and the Maitri, they can build it in that way, then it would be fine. So we'll see what happens. But yeah, if you, if you do a search, you know, there's still some discussion about maybe it, it happening in the future. So fingers crossed that it happens um, better than, than when I was in the field. <laughs> okay, uh, next slide. Okay, so this is the, the, uh, the last kind of finished project that I'll talk about before I talk about my current project. Um, so I, was, I, I am not actually a very tech savvy person, but um, I do, you know, I'm a, I was interested when I, when I heard that there were people that were practicing Buddhism in virtual worlds. I was like, what? What does that mean? Like, oops. Um, why, why, and how? <laughs> so, so I started exploring a little bit, um, and there is a virtual world called Second Life. Has anybody ever heard of Second Life? Okay, a few, okay, one person, <laughs> a few people, okay. So it's this virtual world, and it's, you, it's like a platform, and you go online, and you, um, you get an avatar, and then you can move around in this virtual space, you can fly, you can walk, um, you can make your avatar kind of look however you want it to look. And there are all sorts of culture happening in there, right? There are lots of subcultures, there are people that are making things and buying things, and there are dance clubs. And, and even though, you know, people are engaging in these things in their own homes, there is a social aspect to it, right? You are meeting people and talking to them, and this actually became really especially interesting during the pandemic, right? I mean, people were uh, in their homes and kind of starved for connection, and they were meeting in these virtual worlds and having conversations. So I, there's so much going on in, in these virtual worlds I only, that I only paid attention to this one particular Buddhist space. You can uh, go to the next one, please. So um, this is this place is called the Buddha Center, um, and and they have a schedule. They have a schedule of events. They have a schedule of uh, talks and meditations. And you know, one of the things that was interesting in doing interviews with people who are setting this up is they said, you know, there were some other versions of this in the beginning, where anybody could come and say they were a monk or a nun, but this place, they kind of do background checks, right? They like make sure that somebody is, um, you know, before they allow them to kind of give a, a talk, they make sure that they're at least who they say they are and that they have, if, if they say, oh, I'm a, I'm a monk in the Vietnamese tradition, um, I'm a part of a sangha under this person, they make sure that that's true. So, you know, you could look at their schedule and you can basically sign on and then go to the particular place where people are gathering and there's a way to kind of you push a button and your avatar does a prostration and then you, you pick a cushion and you, and you sit, sit your avatar down on the cushion and then they, they do a meditation. So then they do a guided meditation and so there's somebody kind of guiding the meditation and you're supposed to, in real life, be doing the meditation, right? Um, and, and so the idea is, like, this is another sangha. Uh, and this was very popular, especially with uh, non-heritage practitioners. I didn't find many people who were, you know, you know, somebody from Vietnam who had grown up with, with Buddhism. Uh, it was mostly people that had chosen Buddhism later in life. And a lot of people who didn't have access to a sangha. Um, so this was really useful for me. I was in Manhattan, Kansas at the time, right? And there was no <laughs> Buddha Sangha there for me. Um, so even as a practitioner, I, 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 it, had, it had value, right? And um, so, it, you know, and then there were talks, etc. And you can go to the next slide. You can see kind of how um, some of the visual effects kind of changed over time. Uh, maybe go back <coughs> You can see, uh, so in 2011, you can see what the Buddha statue looked like at the time, and then if you go forward, you can see that you know the graphics got better over time. You can go to the next one. Uh, this was another space that they had set up with one of the um, the monks who was giving a talk at the time, 
Uh, so this wasn't a, it wasn't a meditation, it was a teaching, right? And so you could hear his voice in real life and you were sitting there on the cushion and then you could uh, either put uh, comments or questions in the chat or you could ask them. And it's, again, just a different, a different medium, a different subculture of Buddhism, um, and one that was fairly eclectic. So one thing that was interesting was that it wasn't one Buddhist culture, right? So there were um, there were Theravada uh, monks and nuns, there was um, Zen folks, there were uh, people from many different communities um, that were doing the teaching and leading meditations. So again, not for everyone, but a really interesting little subculture. Uh, I think go to the next one. Um, this was another Buddhist space, right? And uh, somebody had set this up for their teacher, uh, a particular um, Bhutanese teacher. So people were up, so there were some of these spaces that were communal spaces, and some of these spaces were just set up for an individual would um, say, you know, I want to do something for my teacher. Um, and, I, and so they would set up these little chapels and there might be uh, different, you know, different rituals that would happen there. Um, and it might just be that you know, you'd meet your friends there and like have a meditation session or something. So uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, this is the, the last thing that I'll say about this. Um, I was doing an, an interview, right? So as a, as a field worker, I, I was interviewing people who were making things so this is my, my avatar at the bottom and then the person that I was interviewing, his avatar. So I was asking him about um, this prayer wheel that he had made. And he was, and so what he did is he was talking to me about how he made it and why he made it. He pulled it apart. So he has, uh, he pulled it apart and then you can, you can see on the next slide, um, you can go to the next slide, that he put um, Tibetan mantras, so he, copied and pasted Tibetan mantras um, all along uh, the inside of the prayer wheel. If you go back, um, you can see, right, mm -hmm. the, the prayer wheel that fits in there and then which fits in there. Mm -hmm. And so then he, then he put it all back together and sh but showed me that like this was a labor of love for him, right? This wasn't like, uh, this, and it was a, it was a, and he said, "Look, I don't know. Um, you know, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a monk or a nun. I don't know much about exactly what um, good karma this is going to bring. But for me, this is a karma building activity. This is a part of my Buddhist practice, right? I, I and um, you know, I think that it's beneficial for for me as a Buddhist to engage in this space. You can go to the next one. I think." Um, and this is uh, that same um, this that same uh, Buddhist prayer wheel. Uh, it's right there. So he, you know, relocated it somewhere. And then, you know, when I found out that you know it wasn't where it was when I first started doing the research, I was like, where to go, right? And how can I find it? And he had put it in this other this new place called the Kuan Yin Terraces. And, you know, I've, I've published a bunch of articles about this and I could talk about it all day, but I, 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 I can answer some more questions for it about, about it if you'd like later, but um, it's a really interesting culture, right? And there are some people that think, oh, anthropologists have no business doing work in virtual worlds, but we disagree, right? There's, there's culture happening there. People are practicing, they are, um, they're meeting each other. There is, you know, I'm not saying that it's good or bad or, you know, better or worse, but it is culture, right? And and, and if it's culture, then then we, you know, are fascinated and want to learn more. I think that's the last one for that one, but maybe just go one more just to see. Oh, okay. Uh, I guess I was wrong. Um, there were all. Oh, well, I said it. That was the last thing I was going to say, but. See how fascinated I am. There are people that were that were making Buddhist art and selling it, and and you're like selling it who to whom and why? They were sell people were building houses in there, and you know setting up their houses, and they would then buy Buddhist art and take it to their houses, and they would spend time there, and they would have parties, or they might even have like a you know uh, a relationship 
um, inside your second life with your real life partner or with someone else. So people were making real money from these things too. So just fascinating little subculture. Okay, I'm writing a book about Daikokuji and I've been working on this since um, 2015. Uh, so that's when I kind of came and, and got permission and met Reverend Jiko for the first time. And um, you know, this has been a long time. I've actually done interviews with several of you in this room. I think some of you are like, TikTok, uh, you did that interview with me five years ago, what's happening? Um, but because I've only been able to come for, for short periods, um, and then the pandemic knocked everything uh, off kilter, um, you know, and, um, and just it's really hard to sit down and write. So I'm on sabbatical now, and I'm really hoping that I make good progress. But I'm going to kind of walk you through what I think it's going to be and then um, I can take questions about that. Um, I know that we are supposed to eat lunch soon, so I will try to, I'll try to s speed this up a little. Um, so the first, the kind of the introduction, you know, will just be an overview of like, what is this special place? I, I would like to name the book Temple of Great Happiness, and I can, uh, Ray, this was Reiko's idea, again, like five years ago. <laughs> You might not even remember, but you were like, that could be the name of the book, and I'm like, it's happening, I wrote it down, I'm like, Reiko's a genius. <laughs> because this is one of the one, one of the uh, translations of Daifukuji, right, it is Temple of Great Happiness. So um, I will, uh, in my introduction, give an overview, also kind of talk about the things that we have to talk about, like fieldwork and methods and ethics and things like that. Um, the the, uh, the first kind of content chapter will be mostly historical content and historical context, right? So um, talking about the Japanese American community in this area, talking about um, Buddhism in Hawaii more generally, giving a little bit more context about um, uh, the different sects that are here and, and popular, and uh, talking a little bit about the history of this place um, as far as I can uh, you know, collect information, and um, you can go to the next slide. Um, so the net, all of the rest of the chapters are more focused on t the community today, right? And, and when I say today, we talk about the ethnographic present. So, you know, let's say it takes another three or four years for this book to get written. Like the ethnographic present is like this kind of decade of work, right? And this deck, this kind of fuzzy big moment of, you know, from 2015 to uh, 2025 or 26, when is this gonna get published, I don't know. Um, so the ethnographic present is, is um, you know, this decade or so. Um, so I would like to talk about what happens here, right? What is, what, you know, what are the clubs and activities and um, what are the holidays that are celebrated and uh, what is the routine and the, the feel of the place um, I'm also going to talk about, um, uh, you know, I would like to talk about um, a range of members, right? So I've done a bunch of interviews, and I would like to kind of say, okay, well, I have a, you know, here's a a, um, a snapshot of a few members that are uh, heritage members. Here are a few a few um, that are more on the, the non-heritage side of the spectrum, and I'll just explain that quickly if I can. When I first started doing work with, with, um, with Buddhism, and there, the, the terminology that was being used in academia was ethnic Buddhist or elite Buddhist. And ethnic Buddhists were people that you know, grew up with, with Buddhism, and elite Buddhists were people that converted to Buddhism. And I just don't like that terminology. <laughs> I, and, and a lot of my informants don't like the you know, or my interlocutors don't like that terminology either, so I don't want to use it. So instead, I think it's more effective to talk about a heritage spectrum, right? And and to say, you know, some people grew up, you know, this is their heritage, they grew up in this community, and some people are non-heritage Buddhists, they, they chose this community later, and, um, and there's some people that are kind of fall along the middle, right? And, you know, they have, um, you know, uh, relatives um, who are, you know, they, they might be from a more complicated family, right? Or they might have moved here when they were 10, 
right? And so they were enculturated to some extent, but they also have a connection somewhere else. I said I was going to be quick. I'm really not doing a good job. Um, but uh, my point is just that there is no, this is not to uh, say that there's a better or worse type of Buddhist, just that it's useful as an anthropologist to try to help readers understand that there are different people in the room, right? And people that, that um, have, have grown up in this community and people that chose this community. That anthropologically, that's significant. Um, and it has nothing to do with ethnicity, it has to do with enculturation. It has to do with, um, you know, how you know, your, your relationship to the, the space is different if you came to it when you were 50 or 40, you know, 45. That's different than your relationship to it if you were born in that community. Um, chapter three, I would like to talk about the life stages. Um, so looking at um, rites of passage and key events across those life stages. So just looking at the, at the range from, from children's activities um, to uh, the really amazing graduation ritual that you do here, uh, to uh, youth events, um, uh, initiations, weddings, um, uh, work with senior citizens like Project Dana, and, uh, and, and obviously a very important part of any kind of Zen temple, right, is, is looking after the, the, the deceased and kind of caring for ancestors, right? So, so give, again, giving people a sense of that. Um, and for most of you, you might be like, we know all this stuff, right? Yes, you do. You know all this stuff. You are all experts in this culture, right? Or, you know, those of you who are members of this temple, you already know these things. But my Kansas students don't, right? And, like, the people who will read this book don't. They don't know anything about this. And this is an extraordinary opportunity to kind of share this uh, lovely subculture with them. Go to the next one. Um, the next uh, chapter I was thinking about focusing on sacred space making um, and kind of describing uh, altar spaces, describing art. Um, I'm uh, you know, excited to, to talk a little bit about, um, for example, uh, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll mention kind of the important kind of historical um, pieces that are in your collection, but also the Miami Oda pieces, right? And, and Tina's beautiful work, and that's a part of the, the really kind of magical sacred art and sacred space that has kind of been built here. Um, and I cannot even tell you how fascinating the 33 kind of pilgrimage is from an anthropological point of view. I honestly, almost want to write a full chapter about that just because it's so fantastic. Um, it's, it's, so, it's such an incredible way of kind of, of um, replicating sacred space and, and you know, bringing um, this kind of awareness of a sacred pilgrimage root in Japan and bringing it here, kind of making it manifest. Um, it's a, a lovely, lovely ritual, so I, I'm excited to talk about that. Um, and then, um, you know, I teach a class on kind of the anthrop you know, cultures of music and dance. Um, it's my ethnomusicology class. And so I'm thinking about this as like my ethnomusicology chapter, um, because there's just a lot of fantastic music and dance that happens here, right? And so kind of, um, you know, again, giving readers a little bit of a tour of kind of the things that, that, um, that happen. Uh, from things like that are more on the traditional side, like the bicoppo choir, um, to things that are a little bit more kind of like Hawaiian flavor, like the, the happy stormers. And, um, and then, of course, this is my opportunity to talk about the blind dance, um, which again, I really could write a whole chapter about because it's so fun. Um, so that, that is my, my, my thinking about that chapter. And then the conclusion, I think I would like to talk a little bit about the pandemic, how things shut down, how things reopened, um, and how uh, and how the, the temple is kind of looking forward to the future. Um, and so um, that's my, that's my plan. <laughs> that's, this is my, um, this, this kind of represents um, my vision of what I think a really fantastic book about this temple would be. Uh, so,
right? Um, if there were a, a college student in Kansas reading about this community, what would you want them to know, right? What is what is important to, uh, to you and your family? And if and, and if there is a relative of yours that was reading a book about Daifukuji 50 years from now, right, or 75 years from now, what do you wish they knew about this place now? Um, I just spent two weeks in the UH Minot archives, and I was reading a book about um, about this place in the 30s, right? And it, it wasn't just Daifukuji, it was uh, an anthropology text by John Embry, um, and he did work here, so he was looking at the, the whole kind of Kona Coffee community. He talks about, um, you know, Ken, uh, he talks about um, the, the Kumeyaay, he talks about the temples, he talks about all of these things, and I'm just reading this like, this is amazing. <laughs> Thank goodness there's this record of of this community and this culture from the 30s, right? So what would we want to make sure that somebody reading this in the archive 75 years from now, what would we want to make sure that they know about us, right? And and, and our and our temple, right? So um, you know, this is definitely you know focused on Daifukuji rather than the whole kind of area, right? This is not a book about Kona, right? This is a book about uh, the temple, but, you know, what would we want them to know?